Andrew, thank you so much for coming on the show. Really appreciate it. Uh, you've built quite the company here, a really interesting company in density. Tell us why or how or, you know, what, how, why density? How did you come up with this idea? Um, well, we wanted to know how busy our favorite coffee shop was. And it was really irritating that we couldn't remotely know whether or not there was a line. And uh, we were in upstate New York where there's a lot of snow, lake effect snow. And uh, so walking several blocks was a bit more of a pain than, than in California. Um, and so we thought, well, how hard can it be to, to buy something that counts people? And 10 years later, I can tell you, nine years later, I can tell you it, it, county people is one of the hardest problems I'll ever work on. So that's the background. And the idea is it has a small sensor at the doorway leading into a venue. And it kind of like lets that venue know kind of real time how many people are entering or exiting the, the business. I mean, that's one application. Obviously, that's not all of it. Yeah. So <clears throat> the market we serve <clears throat> sort of the initial market that we serve has evolved over time and so too is the technology. So we actually design custom radar sensors. Um, there's actually one here in the booth. It's about, about this big um, and uh, kind of looks like a, a slightly wider Apple TV, a little bit thinner. <clears throat> and um, they get installed in sort of open space inside of large offices or large corporate real estate, large real estate portfolio. And we measure how humans use those buildings. So we don't, we don't really focus on the coffee shop, bar, restaurant, where we, you know, of our origins. We, we really focus on some of the largest companies in the world who have, you know, tens of millions, in some cases, hundreds of millions of square feet of space and very little visibility into how it's used. And we deploy the infrastructure. We count people anonymously. We don't know gender, age, or ethnicity. And in real time, we serve that data back to analytic systems, back to live displays, back to uh, dynamic janitorial. There's like a whole bunch of things that come from uh, people count. Have you noticed like companies are super interested in this data, even more so post COVID when they start thinking about, you know, the remote work versus, you know, in office work versus hybrid are you having a lot of those types of discussions where, where these companies are kind of tracking like, hey, this is, you know, we wanted everybody to come back in the office. Half of them are, actually are. Is that is that kind of like a, a piece of it as well? Yeah. So um, two things happened as a result of the pandemic. So so first off, uh, just to give a sense of scale in the United, in the United States, there's 10.9 billion square feet of leased or owned uh, and occupied space. Um, so that's that's uh, space that is intended to be used, 10.9 billion square feet of office space, just office space. It's about 15 to 17% of commercial real estate in the United States. 4.4 billion of that, so 41% uh, is vacant but paid for, meaning occupied, paid for, leased, so forth, but literally not used. Conference rooms, desks, untouched. Um, it's about $300 billion spent every year on space that nobody uses. Space that gets cleaned many times a day, uh, in some cases five to eight times a day, uh, if, you, if you sort of talk to some folks. Um, that Those numbers are all pre-pandemic. So when the, when the pandemic hit, everybody went home. All those, you know, we had, we had waste, extraordinary waste of space. Nearly half of space was vacant but paid for pre-pandemic. Those numbers only got worse after the pandemic. So everybody goes home. And the two things that happened were a CFOs and C-level teams started looking at their, their portfolios and saying, you know, what are we going to do with all this space? Are people coming back? And um, real estate team said, you know, we're not entirely sure, but we've done some surveys. And they said, well, out of curiosity, totally makes sense. We've never hit a pandemic before. Out of curiosity, how many, how many people were using the office before the pandemic? And the answer was, you know, we're not entirely sure. We've been doing some surveys. I said, you got to be kidding me. This is a billion dollar asset. How do we not know its performance? So essentially scrutiny on this very valuable asset fundamentally shifted as a result of the pandemic because the buildings emptied out. And the second thing is uh, they've been trying to figure out how to bring people back. And, um, and so a lot of the companies that we work with really are measuring the engagement of people in physical space. You know, what happens when you 
turn up turn off a floor and increase the critical mass on other floors it has a big impact on what it feels like to be in office and the trust that builds between teams and so we work with a lot of groups who are who are trying to solve the same basic problem how do you make sure your technology is used for good how do you make sure like you know i could i could see some privacy concerns around the technology yeah so to begin with um we don't hand wave at privacy so um the systems we design even if we were compromised um you can't get personally identifiable information off of our systems it's physically impossible because of the the sensors that we decided to build which are um, anonymous at source which is very different than a lot of other systems which are actually not anonymous at source they get anonymized in transit so um, you have sort of op they call them optical sensors but what they really are, are cameras and they take photographs of whether or not you're at your desk and then they send that data back and they send it back in sort of an anonymized format but it's it's ultimately an anonymized image um, in our case we don't know and so um, we we actually fly through a lot of the uh, sort of security and liability concerns of large corporations because we value individual privacy so so deeply and the rubric for that is if a person has a reasonable expectation to privacy they ought to have it um so that's number one number two we try to give the data back to the people that are in the space so we try not to be just of use to the uh, folks that manage the portfolio or the buildings, but also to the people that are trying to find conference rooms that are available, um, trying to find desks that are available, trying to find sort of the amenities and assets. And so, and we show them what the sensor sees. So we're very transparent about what we build, very transparent about who we're trying to serve, which is ultimately the people that are using the building. And we found that uh, people find the system really cool, really fun to work with, and they choose density because we care so deeply about privacy. How have you grown the business? How has it grown and evolved um, since you started it? Well, when we announced uh, that we had built a people counter and an API, um, we, um, sorry. Um, oh yeah, you're good. When we, when we announced that we built a people counter and API, we got flooded with sort of inbound and the, um, one of the groups that, I mean, we heard from all sorts of different sectors, but one of the groups that we heard from was um, corporate offices, workplaces. And their message was, you know, um, we've been trying to solve this problem for 15 years, 20 years. We've been repurposing retail technology over and over and over again. I've got a locker full of broken devices that don't work. And um, so we so we went out and had some conversations and, and uh, we learned in the process how massive the problem was. Um, so I would say that the early days of how we determined market was very much going and talking to customers, going to talk, going to talking to prospects, and just trying to be students of the problems that they had. And that really refined our approach. It really refined who we we thought of as a of a as a customer, and ultimately it shaped a product. So our our goal just to be you know kind of explicit and I know we're talking about the, our particular company and we should probably be talking about eventually sort of the meta of like building companies but our goal is to measure all built space everything ever built everything to be built large corporate office is an excellent place to begin for a whole host of reasons and so uh, one of the things that was important for us was being able to justify how market selection solves the distribution problem because every company has the same fundamental question how are you going to get customers like how do you solve the distribution problem and there are a lot of ways to, to attack that but um it's a companies that don't solve the distribution problem can have the best product in the world and it doesn't matter how have you solved it well we haven't solved it yet <laughs> but we've got lots of <laughs> hypotheses we got lots of hypotheses on you know 99 percent of the world's buildings are not measured so we have not solved that distribution problem but uh Anonymity, so there's a bunch of things that contribute to solving the distribution problem. Anonymity uh, allows you to bypass a lot of the limitations of deploying product into places where there's a reasonable expectation of privacy. 
um, building an API that people can use so they can integrate it. People counts really relevant in the context of other data. Um, um, building visual systems so that people really trust the system. You know, to be clear, like we don't replace an existing utilization system. Like we're not like a the next utilization system. We're we're usually a new infrastructure for a building. So there's a lot of education. Um, really focusing on customers who can buy once and deploy thousands of times or tens of thousands of times and not going after the long tail of customers uh, because the long tail of customers requires sort of a different product suite, a different support structure. Um, there's just like a whole dip. So we, we really focus on this particular market, which is workplace because it has all the market, all the markers of solving the distribution problem. Uh, you know, we'll have a customer who will buy and they'll, they'll sign a, you know, they'll sign a million dollar contract and they will grow by three X. Uh, and we, we will have only covered five or 6% of their portfolio. So that, that that's by market selection, solving the distribution problem. That's kind of what I mean is like, you know, you sort of focus on the things, whether it's product or market selection or pricing or whatnot that are going to like make it easier to distribute the product uh, to, to ever more coverage, at least in our case coverage. How have you thought about raising capital and what has your strategy been there? Uh, well, the, the problem with raising capital is that like for founders, you know, you only do it once every 18 to 24 months, a little bit longer if you're lucky. And so venture capitalists are experts. They're doing it all the time, you know, mm -hmm. uh, but founders are, you lose the skill set, the muscle that you build during that intense period of time when you're raising capital. And I remember early on, um, you know, it took us like six months to raise, I think, $850,000. Um, it was like our first round. And I think our last round we raised in, um, in 13 days. And for what it's worth, the work that went into those 13 days, the prep work that went into those 13 days, was at least two orders of magnitude more than the work that went into those six months, all of those six months. Mm. Um, and, and so like re really refining the process, it's taken a lot of years to kind of like lay out a playbook of like how we do this. But the, I actually, um, if you, there's a, if you're, if you're interested, <laughs> like I have, like, I actually have like a, sort of like a, a doc that outlines how to think about running a fundraising process, like an efficient one. And, um, and it's just because it's like a really painful, it's a really painful process. Like you, uh, you don't enjoy it. It's a, it's a distraction, but it's fundamentally necessary to building venture scale businesses. And I think venture is net very good for the world. I think it's an extremely important part of the world. Um, but it can be really painful for founders. How has your leadership style changed uh, as the company's grown? Someone gave me a really good piece of advice. So just to be clear, um, uh, it's sort of like an ever evolving thing. So like everything I say should be taken with a giant grain of salt, uh, sort of interpret as you may. But uh, I got this phenomenal piece of advice where um, they essentially said, if you are not looking back at your decisions or your you know, your opinions three months ago and thinking, man, that was really stupid. Like that's something you said or thought was really stupid. Um, one of two things is happening. Either you're not changing fast enough with your company. You're not growing fast enough and staying ahead of your company. Or two, um, uh, your company's not growing fast enough. Your company's not changing fast enough. In either case, you're fired. <laughs> and I, you know, it's a little bit of a, it's a little bit of a tongue in cheek thing, but I, I think it's a phenomenal way of thinking about. You should, you know, run the exercise. Like, think three months ago. Was there something that you thought that you, uh, you were just like, man, that was really stupid. Like, that's I have a different approach to how I might do that. And it could be small, it could be large. Uh, if that's happening, it means you're changing, um, and change is actually the primary objective of a startup and um it just so happens that change therefore is the primary function of a founder otherwise company scales past you and it's really you know the company becomes more important 
and it's always more important. And so you, you sort of replace the leader. So founder CEOs that last all the way through to like scaled uh, public companies are very rare, um, but they're also extremely effective. And, you know, there's lots of examples of this, but um, yeah, change sort of really deeply embracing change is, is uh, important. I can talk about specific things that I've done, but like, I think that that, oh, yeah, that's very, important. yeah. What specific things come to mind? Um, there's like a, you have this, I love product. It's very easy to get lost in the thing you love. Um, but as a, as a company's CEO, you can choose sort of a place to spike, but, but you can only go as deep on that spike as you have covered, you know, your, your, um, your weaknesses and you cover your weaknesses by hiring for them. And so the, uh, I get this great piece of advice from Dick Costello once he was like, your job when you don't know is always the constitution and construction of the team. That's it. Uh, there's another guy I love. His name's, uh, uh Stephen Miles. His, 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 uh, feedback is, um, uh, you are in the people business. Like Andrew, you're in the people business. Do not forget that. That is your job. And so really maniacally focusing on curating the team continuously, um, you know, admitting the fact that, you know, teams are not families, teams are teams and teams tend to be designed to solve particular problems. And as time passes, those problems change. And so if you're, if you're upfront and earnest with your team, that we're a team, not a family. It, it gives you the latitude to have hard conversations. Uh, like, like we, you know, like we've leveled people who were on the executive team who are still at the company. Um, you know, we, we like made decisions that allowed us to speak openly with people and say like, it's not about you not being excellent. It's about where the company is and sort of like what the functions are that you require. And so getting good at that was something that, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time on or try to be to spend a lot of time on and am very much a work of progress. Um, but really like making sure you don't forget the team. Cause if you don't, for, if you, if you focus too much on the product, you focus too much on sales, you focus too much on like one thing, what ends up happening is the company gets built. It just gets built without you, you know? Right. And that is a, that that's, that's how founders actually tend to rotate out. It's how CEOs tend to rotate out is they, they go, they build the one thing and they, they, they forget the rest of it and it gets built. It just gets built by other people. How do you go about your recruiting? What's your process like? Uh, I still interview every candidate um, or every final candidate sort of like gets through uh, the process. I've gotten a lot of flack from our, um, from our recruiting team who is phenomenal, by the way, we have an amazing recruiting team. Um, about being like a like a gate to sort of like moving on but i would say one of the benefits of that is like you get a sense it's 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 actually a two-way street you know you get to really talk about with the person why the company exists and what its purpose is and what will happen if you know you don't die and that is that can be really invigorating and exciting for an individual um and if you don't see that enthusiasm from a person, it can be very telling as to whether or not this is really something they want to do. And you can even ask them, like, is this something that you really want to do? You know, and if you ask it in a way that's like actually earnest, they'll tell you, you know, they'll be like, well, you know, I, I thought I think what you're doing is cool, but I still have some outstanding questions, you know, and then you go and you answer those questions. And if they're still not, uh, you know, convinced, then that's OK. It's, you know, it's not a fit. But um, but yeah, there's a lot of value to like doing the manual work of like focusing on the constitution and construction of the team and having an opinion, you know, I'll often get asked in those last, you know, last interviews by, by really sort of thoughtful candidates, you know, what are your thoughts on the role that I'm like being hired for? And um, my answer is, is uh, almost always, except in the spaces where I have like a, a, some expertise is almost always like, I, I really deeply defer to the function, to the function and that team's determination of, of like your fit to that role. Um, you know, my focus is on the, that is values fit and cultural addition. And then this is actually an important distinction. A lot of people talk about culture fit and maybe this is now 
maybe this is no longer a new idea, but culture fit is actually not a good idea. Uh, you want cultural uh, additions. But your culture is always changing. So like every time you hire a person, it doesn't matter what you want to do, uh, you're going to have a new culture. And it's a question of whether or not they contribute to that culture or detract from it. Values, however, values fit, values match, you need, like you, you must, that's a must. Because if, so in our case, our values are be humble, seek feedback, and always solve the fundamental problem. And maybe I could talk uh, at some point about how we arrived at those values and like when you should have them and that kind of thing. But be humble, seek feedback, and always solve the fundamental problem. And the reason that we we have those is because they're sort of functional. It's like, if you're humble, you're more likely to seek feedback. If you're willing to seek feedback, you're willing to be convinced that you're wrong, which means you're more likely to solve the fundamental problem, which is the only thing that matters in the first place, is the fundamental problem. And so um, in our case, and I think in many startups or most startups, solving the distribution problem is the fundamental problem. Um, anyway, long story short, um, you find folks, when we find folks that are humble, seek feedback and always solve the fundamental problem, like we leap at those people. And what's so cool is that then they come and they join and they meet a bunch of other folks who value the same things, but are culturally different. Does that distinction make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. That, that makes a lot of sense. That's interesting. How did you arrive at the values? So I think a lot of people try to do values day one. And I, I actually encourage like, don't do values um, you know, for maybe a, a year or two, um, because values, when you write them down or you talk about them, um, they're, they tend to be best or most useful or stickiest when they're, uh, they're, they are observations of your team when they are at their best, when we as a team are at our best. At Density, we are not always humble. We don't always seek feedback and we don't always solve a fundamental problem. But we aspire to those things. And when, you know, we were at our best, when we are at our best, it's when we are living by them. That's interesting. Yeah, that's an interesting way to look at it. How do you think about the the future of density? How how far ahead are you of your team in your mind? I always think about this as a CEO and leader. It's like you you probably already have a vision of the company that doesn't exist yet. So what do you, what is that vision? What is the vision specifically for density or how do you sort of yeah, how do what, you think about yeah, like Yeah, what's the vision specifically things? and and the gap? I'm actually interested in the gap as well. Like again, like as CEO, you definitely in your mind have a vision of the company that doesn't exist yet. And how do you get the team to catch up to that? Maybe we start there. Um Yeah, so I, I, I think I want to maybe make a distinction that I actually don't think the team is behind the CEO, meaning like the team doesn't yet have the thing, the vision of like what the CEO has. And so the CEO is going to go off and do a bunch of work that like is going to be different than the, the team is aware of. Right. And then you got to figure out how to catch them up. I think, right. I think a bit, maybe a, a more productive way uh, of, of thinking about it is like, Your job as a leader in any function, but especially a CEO, is to uh, share context. So, like all we we have this term called teamwork. Like not we density, but at, at, you know the world has this thing called teamwork. Really, what teamwork is um, is better described as um, as uh, context, um, prioritization, and sequencing. So. <clears throat> So sequencing is the last thing. Sequencing is like we do this thing and then we do this thing and then we do that thing. That's very tactical. Prioritization is like your your strategy, right? It's like uh, these are the reasons these are our priorities and we should have few of them and they should be important and the, the sequencing should flow from the prioritization. But there's a higher level than strategy, which is the context in which you're operating, how much capital you have, the market you serve, uh, the mission you're after the scope of the problem, the resources you happen to have at your disposal, um, competitors, like the, those, that's all context. And what's so cool is that you can very simply re recognize breaks in that system, you know, otherwise referred to as teamwork. The whole bundle is called teamwork. Um, 
when someone's having a sequencing question or set of set of uh, debates, <clears throat> when they lack uh, sort of shared agreement on priorities. It's like, hey, we need to actually back up and do priorities first. And then sometimes you find priority disagreements on like what's most important. And it's not because the priorities are wrong. It's because they don't have shared context. And so your job as CEO is to think about that context and constantly be talking about the context that you're operating within and then help hire folks work with teams. And this totally is dependent. All this advice is dependent on the scale of your company. When you're three people, you do everything, right? right. When you're 10 people, you do everything. When you are 20 people, you do almost everything, right? You're wearing a lot of hats. When you start to get to like a hundred people, we're, we're sort of in that, in that scale. Um, your job is to figure out how to hire phenomenal people at each of those things at, at sequencing at prioritization and at context setting within their own disciplines. Uh, Andrew, I can't thank you enough for, for joining us and uh, talking about everything you're working on in density. I mean, this has been super fascinating the way you think about this stuff. We end every interview the same way with the, with one question at CEO.com. We believe the chances that are given are just as important as the chances we take. Who gave you a chance that led to, that helped you in your career or in your life that comes to mind when you hear that? Um, yeah, sure. Um, the Dean of the I school, uh, Liz Liddy, um, uh, her son, John Liddy, uh, um, uh, uh, Jonathan Triest, uh, one of our first investors, Jason Calcanis, um, Mark Suster, who, who led our series A founders fund, who led our series B, um, the, my co-founders, um, uh, I have, I have five co-founders. We, we, we started the company as six co-founders and all six co-founders stayed at the company for six years. Um, Rob Grazioli, um, Brian Weinrich, uh, Jordan Messina, uh, Steve Von Deek, Ben Redfield. Uh, these, these people are just phenomenal and they very much took a sort of a chance on me and on the team. Um, we have had uh, hundreds of people sort of work at density over the years and every one of them has contributed in some form or fashion. Um, and you know, one of the, the things that's, I think most rewarding is that at some point you get to start to open doors for other founders and CEOs. And you should do that without asking for anything in return as often as you possibly can. Um, and, and, and with so much enthusiasm that you, that it is unequivocal that the person is going to take the meeting that you're doing the introduction to. Um, I, I remember, uh, sort of the last thing I'll, I'll mention is like, I, I get these intros from, there's a couple folks in my network who are early investors in density who do introductions periodically. And when they do an introduction, they will say in the body of the email, you know, uh, whoever the person is, if you don't find time to meet with Andrew in the next like three days, I will never intro you to anyone else. You have got to meet. It is like, and he's, you know, they're joking. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, but what ends up happening is you start on second base with that person, you show up and like, there's just this continuity of enthusiasm instead of hedging. And so it's like, if you're going to do an intro, like you could say no all you want when someone asks for an intro, but when you do one, do one like over the top, like get, give that person every possible backing you can, because it just echoes into their work with, with your network. Andrew, thank you so much. Congrats on everything you're building and we'll continue to follow it and really appreciate you taking the time. Great. Thank you.